Okay, so we have now a series of three lectures that have to do with data analysis, which I think will be pretty interesting. Uh, the first of which we're lucky to have Rob Tipcharani here. He's a professor of statistics and he's going to talk to us about a method that he was instrumental in developing, which uh, although it's now published a couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago, it still uh, uh, strikes me as, as a very novel and interesting idea, which is that you can get cell type specific gene expression data from a mixed sample. So, Thanks, uh, Holden. Okay, so that, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and as you've heard, I'm a statistician, which I guess I should apologize for maybe. Um, so this is, so the top is a joke I've used before, if I apologize if you've seen it, but a statistician and a biologist are about to be executed and each are granted one last wish. The statistician's wish is that he'd be allowed to give one last lecture on his grand theory of statistics. The biologist then asked that he be executed first. <laughs> <laughs> now, so, but fortunately there's actually, uh, this, things are changing a bit. Um, just last month uh, there was an article which uh, a few of us were interviewed for, of statisticians, talking, they said, the, what are the odds that stats would be this popular? Statistics seems to be having a comeback of some sort, or maybe come back, or there's a lot of interest now in data mining and statistics because of, you know, the amount of data, of course, not only in genomics and proteomics, which you're all familiar with, but in things like Google and Facebook and Twitter and everything else. Um, this might be pushing it a bit. Uh, this is actually how Varian, the chief economist at Google, said the, the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians. Well, um, so whether that's true or not, it, there's, there's a lot of interest in statistics, and uh, I think our, our students are seeing that as well. There's a, uh, the demand for our graduate programs is the, the number of people enrolling is increasing dramatically, and, the, and the, um, the, there's the jobs for these students when they come out, both in academia and in drug companies, but now more in tech companies as well, both tech and biotech. So happily, there's a lot of interest in statistics. And it's, so it's a, very, it's a fun uh, area to work in. This, this particular work uh, is joint with Shai Shen Orr, who was a postdoc here for, in Mark Davis's lab and Atul Butte's lab for a few years, and now has gone back to Israel, but he's still, I think, an adjunct appointment here. And I mean, honestly, this is really Shai's work. I mean, co a lot of our co-authors um, have, have helped, but just was, uh, the idea here is Shai's, and it's his, really his, his project. Um, I mean, he's really the, the principal author. And uh, he's continuing to develop this in, with, uh, with Daphne Kohler as well, in other ways. But I want to tell you about the, so this is the work that, as uh, Holden mentioned, we published about a year and a half ago. Um, and by way of background, of course, you're all, all um, familiar with microarrays and the fact that you can, you can quantify RNA expression um, of, of now the entire genome in a tissue, right? So you take some kind of a sample and a blood test, you assay it, you put it on a chip of some sort, and you get the RNA expression for, you know, the whole genome. Oops. And they're commonly used to, you know, they've been around now for about 15 years or so, and in part were invented here at Stanford, um, to compare, for example, two groups, you know, a normal group and a, a healthy normal group with a disease group, trying to figure out how gene expression is different across those two groups. And so a typical experiment, you have some diseased individuals, control individuals, you take a sample from each of them, you put them on mi microarrays, you get gene expression for every patient, for every uh, every gene on the, on the genome, and you then do some kind of a t-test, right, between the two groups. And you might be familiar with the SAM program, which uh, I developed with, with Gil Chu and others a number of years ago, which is a software package and a method for comparing um, two sets of samples, and accounts for the fact that you're, you're comparing, you're not doing one t-test, but maybe, you know, 20,000 of them. So you, you estimate things like false discovery rate to, to know how many false positives you have in your comparisons. So this kind of thing is commonly done now in labs you know, around the world um, for comparing complex tissues. But it's, it's, it's this limitation which I want to address today, the fact that tissues are, are, are heterogeneous, right? They're not all one cell type. So what you're getting when you make a comparison, you're, getting, you're comparing a soup from one patient to a soup from another patient, a soup of, of, of different cell types, right? And you're seeing the, the total gene expression in the, in the in a microwave typically from the whole, from all the tissues put together, right, in a, in a soup. Now, some people, for example, Steve Quake here at Stanford, are working on ways to get single cell gene expression, but that's really not, um, uh, it's really not scale, you know, cheap enough and scalable enough yet to be uh, widely used. So, so right now, I mean, most people are looking at sort of 
uh, total gene expression across a, a, um, a soup of cell types. And the problem is that there's a confounding, right? If, if I compare a normal patient, healthy patient, to a diseased patient, I get the total gene expression across all the cell types added together, but the cell type mix is different, right? The diseased patient has more of one cell type than another. If I see a difference, I don't know if the difference is actually in the cell, in the gene expression of the cells, certain, or actually to, it's just the fact that the, the diseased patient has more of one cell type than another, right? So there's a confounding there between the proportion of cell types in the tissue and the actual gene expression. What I'd like to have is the gene expression of each individual cell type, right? That'd be really the holy grail. Then I could have much more detailed information about the disease in each of the cell types. Okay. Um, it, it, you, should, you should stop me if, I'm, if you have a question, because I'm, okay, it's, I'm happy to answer questions. So, what, well, I guess the most common solution is just to ignore the problem, right? Um, because it's there, and that's we, you know, we, we, you do what you can do with the technology you have. Um, but when you ignore the problem, you're going to lose some information. I'll show you examples of that. Um, the other solution is to try to separate the cells first, and then look at gene expression, and then put the, the separated cells onto the microarray. Um, that's more co that's costly, right? If you have like five cell types, you're going to have like, five times as many chips you'll use. And again, this is from Shai more than me. I'm not a biologist, but he says that it, it, it affects gene expression, right? The, the act of separation of the cells from each other affects the environment and changes their gene expression. So you're actually, you know, you're, uh, in trying to measure it, you're, you're actually going to change the answer. So, well, that's, so the, the physical solutions aren't great. Increase the sample size. That's always what statisticians will tell you, right? Increase the sample size. With enough samples, in principle, the confounding between those two things will sort of get washed out by the signal. But usually, in my, most microwave experiments, the limitation is sample size, right? It's always, you, you can never seem to get enough samples from this, you know, on a homogeneous set of patients with the same disease. And you're trying to look at a lot, a lot of things across the whole genome. So this will work if there's no systematic difference, or if the systematic difference is small enough that the sample size increase will sort of <coughs> will wash out the differences. So what I want to talk about today, and it was in the paper, is to, is kind of a, what we call a, a deconvolution. So we're going to try to, to back engineer things. So the idea is as follows. We're going to do, uh, do, do the microarray experiment as usual with the mixed sample <coughs> on the soups of cell types. But in addition, count the proportion of each cell type using, for example, facts. So take a bit of the sample off the side and just sort it and count the proportion of each cell type. So we've got some say, so predefined number of cell types you're looking at. In some examples, you'll see in a few minutes, there's five cell types in, in from blood. And now we're going to use this additional information to deconvolve the cell type of the individual, the gene expression of the individual cell types. Okay, so we, we have this, you know, think of it this way, we have a soup of cell types. We get to measure the total gene expression of the soup. We, it's not great because we don't know what gene expression to attribute to each cell type. But someone's going to tell us, or we learn from facts, what the proportion of each of the ingredients are in the soup. Then we're going to use those two pieces of information to try to infer what the gene expression of the individual cell types is for each gene, which we'd like to measure directly, but for the reasons I said in the previous slide, is, is not either not attractive to do it or not ideal. Right? It's got some problems. So it, when you first see this, it's, it's like black magic. And actually, when Shai presented this talk, he presented a talk to me, you know, to our group early on, was his idea, and I thought this was, yeah, how could you do that? That looks like, I don't believe it, right? But if you think about it, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be convinced that it's got a base, it's, it's reasonable and it's got some, it can be useful. And what I, I, I helped try to do was to basically to add some statistical framework to it, his, his nice idea. So here's some notation, and the next slide I'll have a picture that matches the notation. But basically, we, so we, we observe a gene expression values xij, so samples, let's suppose what I have is a single set of samples. I'll get to the moment, the case, the more interesting case we want to compare, say, healthy to disease, but suppose we have a single set of samples, patients with a certain disease, okay? So each patient I, we're going to have uh, gene expression XIJ for his gene J up to P. P might be 20,000 genes. So the XIJ is just the, the table of gene expression measurements that, as usual, one gets from a gene expression experiment. But in addition, I have now the 
cell proportions that I get from facts on those same samples. Okay, so for K samples, let's say K is 5, capital K, I'm going to get the proportions, WIK, of cell types, of each cell type in each sample. Okay? And now we're going to assume that what we see is a mixture of the individual, of the, the proportions times these pure cell types. Right? These, these are what I don't observe. Right? This is, says the overall soup is a mixture of, of components of pure types. Right? These are, these are, so H, HKJ is the gene expression, yeah, I say it here, for, for, the pure, for a pure cell type K. Right? So this is what I like to know. Right? I like to know the gene expression of the individual cell types. I don't, to, I don't get to measure them directly. I get to measure them, uh, I get to measure the total soup, and I get to measure these weights, these proportions. I want to learn this from these two things. Okay, so just to reinforce that in the picture, maybe this is easier to see. My observed gene expression data is on the left, samples by genes. The counts in each of these columns is the counts is the proportion of cell types in the sample I get from facts. And what I want to know is on the right there. Those are the each of those rows is the individual is the gene expression of a pure cell type which I'd like to know. So I'm going to try to use the, l the left two pieces to learn the right piece. Let me pause for a second. This, this is either obvious to you or it's mysterious. Yes? How would you differentiate between having a low expression of a given transcript in every gene as opposed to having a very high expression in a very small subset of genes? It, so, so a, a low transcript, say again in... So like Everything has a really low level yeah. of expression, but it's in everything, or yeah. if it's a really high level, but in a very, very small oh. minority of things. Of cell type. That's a good question. So to differentiate that, you're going to rely on the fact that there's going to be a mix. Of some samples, imagine you had like one sample that was, was, let's suppose there's cell types A, B, and C, right? If what you said was, was the case, and at every sample I had was a third of each of those, I'd be in trouble, because I couldn't untangle them. But if I had some samples that were nearly pure A, some nearly pure B, some nearly pure C. You can imagine how you could untangle that now, right? Because, so it, it's, it's a good question. It, it's sort of the, it hinge, this whole method hinges on the fact that I've got enough variety here that I can untangle that kind of confusion, that, that kind of confusing situation, okay? Yes? From the patient? No, well, not from the same patient or from a homogeneous set of patients. So the assumption is going to be yes. Exactly right. So, right. So the, the basic methods, which you'll see in some examples, I'm going to have a group of healthy patients and a group of diseased patients. I'm going to apply this method to each group separately. But I'm assuming that the groups themselves are, are reasonably homogeneous internally. Right. You're, you're right. If the, I need repeats, <laughs> which are the rows of this matrix. So these are good questions to help clarify this. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Right. I'm basically maybe equalizing the question with So uh one of the one of the smallest the range of percentage of difference between the presence of cells in patients that would allow us to do the become five percent, ten percent. Well, yeah, the the question is I don't have a there's there's not a single answer because you know, typically you're going to use this to compare two groups. So the answer to your question also depends on how different the groups are with respect to gene expression. But I can tell you that when you'll, when you, as the talk progresses, you'll see that we get, we'll apply the method, we'll, we'll get a, a false discovery rate curve. And if that curve, that curve gives an idea of whether we have enough variation. It gives an idea of how much information is in this experiment. So uh, if it's a case that in my experiment I don't, have enough, I don't have enough variety here, we'll see in the false discovery rate curves that they'll be too high. And I'll, I'll go, one would have to go back and say, well, I need to get more samples, or at least more samples with more variety of cell type proportions. Okay, so this is good. So here's a little toy example, just to again, reinforce it before I, oh, I didn't actually say what, oh, did I say? Yeah, I, I should have said this. So, I mean, the, the, uh, 
statistical punchline is how do you do this? Well, it's just a, a regression, a linear regression of each column, each gene, on the cell type matrix to get each column of that matrix. Right? Because it's just a linear, you know, those of you familiar with regression, or most of you, right, this is a linear model, a separate linear model for each gene. So I estimate the linear model by least squares. So I regress this on this no matrix to get the coefficient. I do that for every one of these columns. Okay, so statistically, it's actually very simple, although there's some details which I won't go into, but it's just a, it's a series of least squares regressions. So, for example, you might, might have three samples with two cell types. And see, I'm in a nice favorable situation here. I've got some great variety in the cell type mix, right? And uh, this is what I want to know, right? And if you just do the regressions, you get, you get this. So, I mean, what's happening here, this, if it still seems a bit like magic, right? You're, you have this mix, and you have the counts, and you're using the fact that these guys are all sharing the same counts to sort of figure out what the common ingredients must be, right? And I think someone already asked, you have to have more than one sample. Yes. What's relying on the fact that we've got three, you know, um, more samples than there are cell types here, right? So the fact that each one of these guys is the same mix of these unknown quantities, we can infer what the unknown quantities are. We can, that's what this, the formula is doing. It's saying, what's the most likely set of pure ingredients that, given these weights, would produce what we see in the left? Okay. So now to actually use this in practice, we're going to the most common use of this is we're comparing two groups. Right. See a normal group versus a disease group. We fit this model separately to each group, and now we can we can do t-tests. Or some of you are familiar with the SAM program, which is basically a method for doing t-tests from um, with multiple. I mentioned that before but with multiple genes. We can do it for each pure cell type, right? So we can imagine. What I'm saying is, we can imagine that we have, we can do this, and then say, imagine this is what I actually observe. And then do a, do a SAM-like test on this data, because this is actually more interesting, probably. Right? I can now make comparisons across pure cell types. So that, that's one way to use this system. The other way is to sort of to say, well, see, the problem in the first place is the samples were comparable because the cell type proportions were different. We can adjust the data so that, to, uh, so that it looks like what we'd expect to see if the cell type proportions were the same. In other words, what do I mean? I mean, these aren't very comparable because the mixes are different, right? But with this information now, I can, I can um, back adjust and now adjust this data to, be, to look like, for example, what it would look like if each of these were 50-50, right? And that makes, these, that makes these samples now more comparable. Why would I do that? Well, now I can apply hierarchical clustering or other things to this. Just I can look at the data in a way that more, in a fair way, because the data is now I've removed this confounding, and I've, I've made the data more comparable. So e our, our method allows you to do either of those things. So two examples of this in the paper. One, um, artificial brain and, 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 and liver tissue mixed in various proportions. In this first, in our first artificial experiment, we, what Shai did is he actually he took some pure, pure cell types, he measured the gene expression, he mixed them together, and measure the gene expression on the mixtures as well. So this is an unusual situation where we actually have the goal. We know the, the correct answer, right? Because we have the pure, the pure and the unpure, right? the pure and the mixed. So we can see how well is the deconvolution of the mixed recovering the known pure. So this was like a proof, proof of principle. This is, um, the second one was actually a real example. Um, kidney transplant patients looking at stable versus uh, re rejection of the, of the transplant looking at, at blood samples taken before the transplant in five cell types, trying to predict from, from their cell types uh, whether a patient's uh, transplant would be stable or reject in the next six months. So let's, let me show you the example. So that for the brain and liver tissues, so let me begin the details. They were mixed in various proportions, 100, 0, 75, 25, et cetera, to 0, 100. And then we gave the mixed samples to this system, and we said, 
we, we, uh, we recovered the pure cell types, and then we compared the, the, the estimated pure cell type expression to the, to the, to the measured. Because again, in this case is unusual. We actually could measure that we, in an artificial experiment, we, we measured the pure gene expression. So we could see whether, how it did. And so on the, these are plots now for liver and brain. These are the, uh, um, the measured gene expression. And this is the, the, the estimated from deconvolution. And you can see there's a bit of a bias, but um, the number of cells here is like 0.1% or so. There's, there's many, many cells here. So um, the uh, overall, the correspondence is very good. And the same for, for brain. So we're trying to, 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 to estimate the pure gene expression. We've done a good job of it. Correspondingly, we can say, well, we can, we can take uh, the, pure, the pure cell type gene expression that we estimate, mix them together with the, with the known proportions, and that's on the vertical axis, and compare that to the total gene expression we measured, and it's, again, very good correspondence with some, some cases off the line. But again, it's a very small proportion of the, of the number, and the correlation is very high. Okay. And now the kidney, the, the kidney transplant example. Um, you know, a whole blood gene expression, 24 patients, uh, 15 acute and rejection, 9 stable, and CBCs on five, in, uh, five cell types. Right? So we know, we know the, the proportion of cells in each of these cell types, and we get the total gene expression from the blood sample. And here we don't have the gold standard, right, because we we're not able to, well, at least apparently it's not feasible to separate the cells and measure the gene expression, or at least if we do so, it'll alter the gene expression. So here we, all we have is the total gene expression. We're trying to learn some additional information from the individual cell type counts. So on this slide is just a, st a standard analysis that, 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 that um, it doesn't use the cell cell counts. So you, all you get is the whole gene ex expression on the mixture. And so, again, for the disease and disease control, here we're talking about rejection and stable. Here is, these are plots of, of uh, false discovery rate versus the number of genes called significant, right? Um, and the false discovery rate, this curve is saying, this false, this false discovery is about 60%. So this, if you, basically, if you apply SAM to this data to compare the two groups, you don't get very much. You get, you get, you get like a false discovery of 60%. And if you look at the, just the genes that either go up or down, similar, the story is the same. Um, if you cluster the samples, again, with respect to their whole gene, the uh, whole sample gene expression of the mixture, you get this clustering tree, and there's, well, the, you can't see very well, but the twos and the ones are basically all mixed around. So the, 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 they don't separate well at all with respect to stable versus reject. So from the, the, from the, uh, the mixture of the five cell types, there's really not much information, it appears, about whether you're going to reject it, the, the kidney transplant. So now we try to apply this method to see whether it can drill down and get some additional information. So it gives us a schematic of reminding you what we do, this deconvolution. And now, so we have these five cell types. So we applied this method to each group, the stable and the reject group, in the five cell types. And that gives us um, cell, cell type specific gene expression for the five cell types. And here they are. And what I did is I then compared, did a SAM test now basically for each cell type versus, across the two groups, stable and reject. And monocytes showed quite the false discovery rates are around 10%. You've got about up to 200 genes with false discovery at 10%, right? Which you did, we didn't see before. We didn't see that before because it was obscured, presumably, by the... Right here, we didn't see much at all because in the soup of things, because of the, the, the heterogeneity of the samples, the signal in the monocytes got... was masked, right, by the, by the, the other cell types. So the, this was the... the the most promising um, f finding from the deconvolution. And then if you look at um, up and down genes separately, you, you get some potential signals in other cell types. Further, if you, if you cluster 
Um, so here, so here, we've done, here what I've done here now is, um, is basically to cluster on the basis of monocyte gene expression only, right? And you get now almost, I guess, perfect separation between the two groups, right? Because here's the twos, and here's, the, here's the, the ones, right? So if you look just at monocyte gene expression, and we don't have it directly, but we've inferred it from this deconvolution, you get perfect separation between the two groups. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, the method is called CS-SAM, cell-specific SAM, cell -specific SAM um, uh, which again, it, and it, it works basically, you can, uh, you can deconvolve de cell types, gene expression from a single group, and you can also use it for comparing but a number of applications. You can use it to compare two groups and other, other kinds of phenotypes. One issue which the practical issue is whether you use the log or the regular scale, right? It's, always, it's often an issue in microarrays because some, like two-color arrays, use a log ratio, whereas um, AFI arrays are not on a log scale. So this is kind of a choice you have to make when you look at the data. You do various plots and decide whether the log or the regular scale is more appropriate. And um, there's a package in, in the R language which Shai has put together called CSM, which he can, is available. And we're also working on a point-and-click kind of SAM-like pr program, which is not quite ready yet, but um, which will do this analysis without any, you know, command line um, software. It's just be point and click. So that's actually all I wanted to say, and happy to take questions about it. Well, we, we didn't do a cluster. We have tried to, to regularize the regression in some way, um, and it didn't really make much difference. Um, but it's, yeah, clustering, I guess, could help to denoise things. Um, of course, I mean, you can, you know, when you, when you, when you do the method we have, then we do, do post-hoc clustering as well. So it's not clear whether, I mean, it's, it's worth trying, but. The, whether some kind of regularization or clustering up front helps or whether it's good enough later. Yes? Are the RNA pushed available through the bioconductor or would we have to email it to the um, Have a look. It, it might be on, on CRAN or bioconductor. Okay. And yes. Also, mm -hmm. uh, if you have a frequency of like 0.2%, do you think you'd still be able to find that? 0.2%. So um, yeah. I would guess not. Yeah. Again, you can try it, and the, the false discovery rate gives you a quantitative check on how much information. But my gut feeling would be that that small, that rare a cell type would not be, uh, you know, useful. Yes. Oh, here. Okay. Prior knowledge on the proportion. So, are you saying you, like the case where you don't actually have the proportions, or there's some uncertainty in the proportions? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I actually, think, I, think, uh, I think Daphne Cohen and one of her students are doing something like that. Um, yes, they're, yeah. She actually talked about this, uh, that last year at this meeting. But she also reported it wasn't working so well. So um, anyway, if you looked, maybe if you emailed her or looked on her webpage, you might see their latest update. Yeah. Yes? Well, uh, so I've got, uh, and, and I, I want to, so I have some healthy patients and I have some diseased patients, but they're treated with different compounds. Well, then, uh, who knows, right? Yeah. Sorry, within what? Within the, yeah. Well, I mean, it could be, that could be problematic, obviously, if the compounds are affecting gene expression. You know, what, what we're seeing here is kind of an average statement about the whole disease group. But if you're telling me, right, that it's different, um, if there's different drugs, then you, you actually want a maybe a patient level deconvolution. And that's actually, I mentioned uh, Daphne Cole, that's part of what she's trying to do with the Bayesian model, trying to get, see, we're going to hear a group level deconvolution, right? And we're using the fact that we get repeat samples and that the group is re reasonably homogeneous. But your, your situation group is not very homogeneous, perhaps, because of the different drugs. And then you'd want, in theory, you'd want a person level deconvolution. But that seems to be fundamentally harder.
and at least based on, on Daphne Kohler's experience. As you, you, you'd guess it would be, right? Because there's no, there's no replication. So you've got to rely on some other, maybe a prior to give you the information. Other, is there a question at the back? How many cell types? Uh huh. So, yeah. Who did? Who? Oh, I don't know that work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had a, I had a graduate student who was looking at that in cases where you, you don't you don't measure. Well, you measure some cell types, and you, su and you suspect there's more that aren't measured, maybe. Or. or Uh, I think it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Actually, Shai has has done. I think it's a separate paper in the works, or maybe written on that. Which he he doesn't measure the. So he doesn't actually. You get back to this picture, just so everyone knows. He doesn't measure the he difference. We don't measure this, but you measure, as you say, some important genes that um, characterize each cell type. And he actually goes to Geo to try to get some idea of which gene. He tries to recover, recover this without knowing it. And it's, the results are not as robust yet, but um, it's, it's definitely got potential.